It's corn. Corn is a staple of our diet and has been for hundreds of years. It's the second most grown crop, loved by many, and most likely you'll eat a corn product today. After the corn kernels are taken off the cob, we are left with a pile of seemingly useless cobs. Or are they? It may seem impossible, but we can do chemistry with these discarded corn cobs and get a pretty fascinating compound. Just as microbes can produce chemicals, so can animals and plants. Corn cobs contain molecules that we can use as a starting point for synthetic chemistry. We begin by placing 30 grams of corn cobs into a flask. You can buy broken up corn cobs as animal bedding. It's much easier to work with than full cobs. Next we set up a simple distillation setup. One part to take note of is what's known as a Claisen adapter. This is a precaution that we'll discuss later. Next we add 175 milliliters of 3 molar hydrochloric acid. After the addition we throw in a few boiling chips and some glass beads. Now we seal up the flask and start heating. We start low and slow, gradually increasing the heat. If we heat too quickly, a process known as bumping will occur, when the material will suddenly boil and push out of the flask into the condenser. This is not good, as it will ruin our product. The addition of boiling chips and glass beads should reduce the chance of bumping occurring. Even if bumping does occur, the Claisen adapter will give us time to remove the flask from heat and hopefully save the extraction before any of the extraction material is pushed through the condenser. You can eat corn due to it primarily being made up of starch that is consumable by us humans. Unlike the cobs, which are primarily made up of cellulose, you cannot digest cellulose. That's why the husk of the corn kernel is able to pass through you without looking very much different. Mixed in with the corn cob cellulose is a chemical chain known as xylan, made up individual monomers called xylose. Xylan, in the presence of acid, undergoes a reaction to produce xylose. Due to the overwhelming acidic conditions, a further reaction occurs, producing furfural from that xylose. As water in the acid boils off, it will carry the produced furfural over through the condenser. I ran the distillation until around 40 milliliters of distillate was collected. The furfural solution may be or might turn purple, which is common due to oxidization. This is not a problem, some acid will come over through the distillation. By using some 2 molar sodium hydroxide, we can take care of that acid and bring it up to about a pH of 4 to 6. The distillate was then transferred to a separatory funnel and mixed with a few milliliters of dichloromethane. The organic solvent dichloromethane will dissolve any furfural produced and remove any that might be dissolved in the water. The organic layer is then transferred into a beaker and dried with some anhydrous sodium sulfate to remove any water. The dry dichloromethane is then transferred to a new beaker and the solvent is evaporated off using a steam bath. This leaves us with fear for all. I transferred it to a teared vial and got around 1 gram of product. Completely pure fear for all is a clear to light brown color, but will darken as it's exposed to air. So the color is correct and the smell is right. For those wondering, it has a sweet bread with an almost woody almond-like fragrance. But let's take a further look through some analysis methods. First instrumental method is simple infrared spectroscopy. We can take a drop and place it onto the diamond detector of the FTIR instrument. And taking a scan, we get a nice spectrum out. The data shown by IR shows bonds, their stretching, bending, and vibrations. Knowing the structure of ferrofrol, we can take a look at a few distinct areas. There are six that I'll be looking at first. The carbonyl stretching, C double bond O. Ferrofrol contains a carbonyl group, which typically appears in the region of 1690 to 1750. An aldehyde stretch, a C bond H. The aldehyde functional group in furfural contributes to its peak in the region of 2700 to 2850 due to the C bond H vibrations. Aromic ring stretching, C double bond C. Furfural's aromic ring vibration typically manifests in the region of 1500 to 1600. Out of plane bending of an aromatic ring, C bond H. This typically appears in the region of 690 to 900. Though it can be weak in furfural due to its relatively small aromatic ring. Furan ring stretching, C double bond C. 
Furan ring in the Fearful Roll contributes to its vibrations in the region of 1600 to 1650. Furan ring bending, the C bond H. This typically occurs in the region of 900 to 1000. And we can double check our analysis by running a similarity search. Now, it wasn't the right molecule, but by looking at what it came up with in the library, it's not the same thing at all. These databases only have so many molecules in them, and it's perfectly acceptable that this library may not have Fear for All in it, as it's a pretty uncommon compound. IR is a great instrumental method, but it only shows functional groups and bond vibrations. So we need a more concrete method for determining the structure of the molecule, and nothing does this better than NMR. I could also confirm this with GC mass spec, but I'm almost out of $800 helium. So instead, let's double check with the NMR. With nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, we can gain further insight to the molecular structure of a sample. NMR spectroscopy exploits magnetic properties of certain atomic nuclei, particularly that of hydrogen and carbon. These elements are very abundant in our organic molecules, like furfural. For our purpose, proton NMR, or 1H NMR, is particularly informative. Furfural contains several hydrogens in various chemical environments due to its molecular structure, and these environments produce distinctive peaks in an NMR spectrum. I took a sample of furfural and dissolved it in some deuterated chloroform in an NMR tube. The tube was then inserted into the NMR and ran. We got out what we would expect to see with a H1 NMR spectrum of fear for all. The aldehyde hydrogens, a CHO, would typically appear as a singlet or doublet around 9 to 10 ppm. The hydrogen atoms of the furan ring would produce peaks in the region of 6 to 8 ppm which is shown. There is a small peak upfield about 1.8. This could be various contaminants, but most likely is just a small amount of water. NMR is able to pick up a lot smaller quantities than FTIR can. We know we have fear for all, and we know we have waste that was produced. This waste can be neutralized with some sodium bicarbonate and disposed of. With fear for all in hand, we can do a lot of chemistry with it. So what do you want to see? I would like to take a moment and thank our channel members. I recently opened up the channel membership page, so if you want to support the channel in a more personal way, check that out. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you again.